I presume I was inspired by the fact that uh, I've been uh, interested in uh, what happens to the heart, uh, the cardiovascular system, and particularly what happens to the lining of the blood vessels uh, in space, or what is referred to as microgravity. And this has been a very exciting venture for me, um, and I've been gratified by the fact that um, the public in general, no matter what one's background is, um, the public is very, very interested in what happens in space, or what is referred to as microgravity. We use the word microgravity because there isn't um, the complete absence of gravity, so it's referred to as microgravity. On my uh, background uh, is the fact that I, I've been a, a physician uh, since 1954 and a specialist in internal medicine and particularly with an interest in cardiology. Um, I, find, I think that cardiology is one of the most interesting subspecialties um, in, in medicine. And as far as when did you start this business, um, I've been a physician since about 1954 and um, retired in, I believe, about 1994. And um, since then, and in the last 20 years or so, I have been very interested as to what happens to the heart in space and specifically um, what happens to the lining of the blood vessels in space that is called the endothelium. Um, we use the word, as I said, space, and it involves um, microgravity and what happens to the cardiovascular system is very, very interesting, and um, I've had the pleasure of being involved with it for perhaps 20 years. Um, I've made somewhat of an end run around NASA because uh, I think that uh, although NASA has published a great deal of uh, uh, publications about various aspects of what happens to the body uh, in, in, in microgravity, um, I have uh, gone into it uh, to a greater degree, and I've been particularly interested, as I stated, in what happens to the lining of the blood vessels of the endothelium. We don't belong in space. We don't have the genes to uh, go into space, um, and as a result, the complications are uh, very, very interesting, unique, and uh, it's been an exciting journey for me for perhaps the last 20 years. Uh, the lining of the blood vessels is, is very vulnerable in, in space and uh, subject to a great deal of injuries because one of the problems in space or microgravity is the fact that the adrenaline levels are about twice the levels as on Earth. And with the adrenaline levels uh, being perhaps twice as, as great as they are on Earth, the, uh, uh, the uh, risk to the lining of the blood vessels uh, is considerable. In uh, one of the major problems, as I stated, is the fact that with the elevation of adrenaline, there is in turn a reduction in uh, magnesium ions. And with a reduction in magnesium ions, um, it creates a great deal of havoc because magnesium is necessary for um, over 300 uh, enzymes in the system, and um, that uh, creates the problems of constriction of the blood vessels, disturbances in heart rhythm, um, vicious cycles between high adrenaline and low magnesium ions. Uh, and the problem is that one of the major problems is the fact that, that with uh, microgravity, there is atrophy of the skeletal muscles uh, and atrophy of the bone. And with the 
uh, necessity of exercising perhaps at least a half hour a day every every day uh, there is in turn the potential uh, of clotting uh, because the uh, circulation may be impaired because a half hour a day uh, of exercising the arms and legs and the necessity of doing resistance exercises using a treadmill um, all these factors uh, can create uh, problems with uh, impairment in circulation, blood clots, uh, spasm of the blood vessels, and um, with the necessity of uh, magnesium, uh, there is the necessity as well uh, that one has to uh, inject magnesium subcutaneously, perhaps at least twice a day, because there is impairment in gastrointestinal absorption. And with the impairment in gastrointestinal absorption, the magnesium levels can be invariably reduced and one can't survive without enough magnesium. So I've been involved for the last 20 years at least in research um, as to uh, how to prevent the problems of magnesium deficiency. Since there is also impairment in gastrointestinal absorption, whatever magnesium is given it has to be given subcutaneously, uh, which means that you're going to have to subject uh, an astronaut to uh, being poked uh, twice a day. Uh, and uh, this uh, is somewhat painful. And uh, the only, that's the only way that one can uh, be ensured that there were the storage sites of magnesium in the skeletal muscle and bone will be adequate. Uh, as far as when did you start this business, um, it's, in my case, it certainly is not a business, uh, even though uh, the company is called Business Talk Radio. But um, I've been involved with research uh, as far as magnesium is concerned, what happens to the astronauts in space since the early, two th since, uh, uh, the early uh, 90s. Um, and as I stated, it's been an exciting journey. I might you start as, a, as an introduction to uh, a book by James R. Hansen. Um, I don't know whether you can see this, but uh, this is the first man. Perhaps many of you have, uh, are familiar with the fact uh, and has, have seen the movies, The First Man. It's the biography of Neil Armstrong. And since Neil Armstrong was the first human being to step on the moon, his name will be, a, be, be out there uh, probably hundreds, uh, I shouldn't say hundreds, but thousands of years from now. Um, he has died uh, at age 82 after complications of bypass surgery. And when Neil Armstrong was on the moon, uh, he had a pro had problems with uh, severe shortness of breath on the moon, and I published that a number of years ago. I might read what James R. Hansen, the author of First Man, wrote uh, about Neil Armstrong uh, as an introduction. Uh, this paperback edition of First Man, The Life of Neil Armstrong, was published in 2018. Uh, and uh, I've, it's been very flattering for me because on page 283 and 284 in the book uh, and in the index, uh, it is devoted to uh, my work. So I might just read uh, most of what James Hansen said um, stated about my work. It says, in recent years, an American physician by the name of William J. Rowe, who has spent over two decades researching the impact of spaceflight on human 
physiology, particularly its vascular complications, has published a series of papers on what he calls the Neil Armstrong syndrome. Well, actually, I didn't write a series of papers uh, with that title, but one of my uh, articles uh, is devoted to the Neil Armstrong syndrome, but I didn't really specify it uh, with the use of the words, a series of articles. In a nutshell, Dr. Rowe has argued, based on medical data from Apollo 11, that Neil Armstrong, during the last 20 minutes of his lunar EVA, an EVA is a spacewalk. So during his spacewalk on the moon, suffered severe dyspnea. Dyspnea is a medical term, D-Y-S-P-N-E-A, which means shortness of breath. And, uh, and with his twice verbally notifying mission control about it during a four minute interval, and that Neil Armstrong ex also experienced severe tachycardia with a heart rate up to 160 per minute. Tachycardia just means a rapid heart rate. Um, and that Neil had experienced, in addition to this tachycardia, significant shortness of breath. And uh, he cites uh, the fact that I published the Neil Armstrong syndrome in the International Journal of Cardiology in 2016. What caused Armstrong's moon cardiac scare, uh, I, that's the title of a, an article that I published in Spaceflight magazine, which is published by the International uh, Journal According to the research physician, since catecholamine levels, these are chemically related neurotransmitters such as adrenaline, in space are twice the levels that uh, exist uh, in the lying position on, uh, that we call the supine position, it should not be surprising that spaceflight is conducive to catecholamine cardiomyopathy. Uh, catecholamine just means adrenaline. So to translate this into simple language, it means that it should not be surprising that space flight is conducive to uh, problems with the heart because of excessive uh, adrenaline. And this, in turn, can induce temporary heart failure. And Armstrong lightly suffered from it late in his spacewalk. In addition, uh, in, in uh, too high adrenaline levels, Rowe has underscored there are low magnesium ions in space. Uh, and the word ion, this just means the electrical activity in, involved with, uh, with low magnesium and vicious cycles between the two. Now, magnesium is a very, very important uh, survival mechanism because magnesium is involved in over 300 enzymes. Uh, I published a number of years ago uh, an article called Correcting Magnesium Deficiencies May Prolong Life. That was published about 2012 and I'm very proud of that article. Uh, I've published uh, about 70 articles uh, as the sole author uh, and 30, about 35 of them, uh, or about half of them, are peer-reviewed articles. The rest have all been published in Spaceflight magazine. Well, this one, Correcting Magnesium Deficiencies May Prolong Life, that I wrote in 2012, was uh, placed by Global Medical Discovery in the top 20 of about 70 uh, medical articles. Rowe has underscored there are low magnesium ions in space and vicious cycles between low magnesium and high adrenaline, and which can quickly take an astronaut's heart into tachycardia. Tachycardia just means a rapid heart rate and trigger uh, what he refers, what is referred to as oxidative stress this is just a mechanism which can damage the lining of the blood vessels. 
Uh, and what I've been concerned about for the last 20 years is the uh, are the problems uh, involving the lining of the blood vessels that we call the endothelium, and that this problem uh, in microgravity uh, may uh, be fatal. In Rowe's view, it was likely that it was this condition that also explains astronaut James Irwin's cardiovascular complications on Apollo 15, when Irwin became seriously dehydrated when his in-suit water device did not function and he had no access to any water during his three excursions. Um, one should keep in mind that since we're talking about the ex exploration of the moon, um, obviously the moon is very, very hot with extremely high temperatures and this can uh, quickly, with an excursion on the moon, cause severe dehydration. I believe that the, that the greatest problem that we have in space is dehydration because of the, the storage sites uh, 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 are involved um, in providing uh, water. The storage sites are in the arms and the legs. And in one, unless one exercises enough in microgravity, uh, one is very quickly going to become uh, de very severely dehydrated uh, with the potential of causing, as I stated, high adrenaline. Uh, I've also mentioned the fact that there are low magnesium ions in space and vicious cycles between low magnesium and high adrenaline. And uh, Hansen emphasizes that, uh, and, and quotes my emphasizing the fact that this can quickly take an astronaut's heart into what is called tachycardia or rapid heart rate, along with uh, problems that are referred to as oxidative stress uh, and ultimately with the risk of damaging the lining of the blood vessels. And this in turn may be fatal. In Rowe's view, it was likely that it was this condition that also explains astronaut James Irwin's cardiovascular complications on Apollo 15. When Irwin became seriously dehydrated when his in-suit water device did not function properly. Um, in Neil's case, Armstrong's lunar heart rate up to 160 was conducive to damage to the lining of the blood vessels while still in microgravity uh, approximately 30 minutes before uh, he, there was a splashdown in the Pacific. And his heart rate, by the time uh, he had reached just 30 minutes before landing, his heart rate dropped all the way from 160 down to 61. This significant reduction can best be explained this way, that during the three days back to Earth, Despite the reduction in thirst and microgravity, he replenished his very depleted plasma volume, thereby reducing the gradient at the site of protrusion of the septum into the ventricle. The ventricle is a large chamber uh, uh, in the heart uh, and is a, basically a pump. I might interrupt at this point uh, just to state that um, about 10 years ago, uh, after uh, I, I went out to Colorado Springs to interview um, Irwin's widow. Irwin died, um, at, at, I think, about age 45 after uh, a couple of years after he'd been on the moon. And because of the insults on the moon, the damage to the lining of the blood vessels and the high adrenaline and in turn, the low magnesium ions, all of this contributed to his uh, congestive heart failure. It emphasizes the fact that, that we really don't belong in space because we don't have the genes to go there. Um, I, th I think that also I might state that probably many who have been in space um, have 
paid the, the ultimate price with um, having died uh, years before uh, they otherwise would have uh, lived because of the problems involved with microgravity. It should be added that Dr. Rowe does not believe that Neil Armstrong's syndrome is from a cardiovascular standpoint uh, peculiar to Armstrong. Uh, Rowe, now living in, in uh, retirement in, in Virginia, believes that it is a matter of human cardiovascular physiology generally that, uh, that this problem uh, will be uh, a matter of, of considerable, uh, uh, this, that, that, that this problem of dehydration with global warming will be a major problem to mankind. Dr. Rowe's analysis and views on the issues of human physiology in space are controversial, controversial, and would become even more controversial if they were more widely known, especially by those proposing human trips to Mars. For that long duration spaceflight mission, Dr. Rowe states in his article, Genetic Gifts and a Mars Mission, which was published in Spaceflight magazine in 2017, that even without considering unknown radi radiation, our best chance of surviving a 20-month money a 20 month round trip to Mars is to take advantage of genetic gifts. Recently, a Kenyan ran a marathon in two hours and 26 seconds. Similarly, I have emphasized the fact that man's best chance of surviving a trip to Mars is by educating a group of young men, of Bushmen capable of running for two days across the Kalahari Desert without water and in their 20s send them to Mars with a return before age 30 as the vaster repair mechanisms are incomplete over this age. I might state that I've been to Africa uh, eight times on safaris, uh, most of it on foot, and I've flown over the Kalahari Desert uh, several times and uh, there really is, there ain't nothing there, to, to, to uh, use a phrase that probably sums up the problems. My particular interest has been cardiology, and during the 34 years of my solo practice of internal medicine, I supervised over 5,000 symptom-limited Bruce Maximum Treadmill Stress Test. I was very fortunate to have moved to Toledo, Ohio, where I practice medicine, and to have met the holder of the Guinness Book of Records, a Chinese Canadian by the name of Sai Ma, S Y, last name Ma, M A H, who completed 524 marathons. At the time I studied Sai Ma in 1988, I had been invited to present a paper in Beijing, China, and used Sai Ma as my role model for having completed 524 marathons. Just think of a human being having completed 524 marathons. Uh, Sai Ma was running uh, 40 marathons a year for over 20 years. I had supervised the symptom limited maximum treadmill stress test <clears throat> on Sai Ma and to my surprise, he was unable to complete stage five of the Bruce treadmill stress test because of his shortness of breath. Um, over at least a 20 year period, I supervised over 500 maximum treadmill stress tests. And with that experience, uh, I was amazed that uh, a Guinness Book of Records runner couldn't uh, complete, uh, couldn't really go beyond five, the f uh, five stages of this stress test. And uh, in, in Sai Ma's case, it was because of his shortness of breath. 
Ten months after I studied him, he died at age 62 at an autopsy. He showed focal areas of scar tissue in the heart muscle, and yet his circulation appeared normal. And I subsequently published in The Lancet, which is a very distinguished medical journal, that extraordinary, unremitting endurance exercise can injure a normal heart. In addition, I studied in, uh, the 1987 United States Endurance Runner of the Year, Mary Hannadell, who just by coincidence today uh, uh, celebrated her birthday. I got an email from her, and uh, this very day that we're discussing, I'm discussing this, uh, Mary's birthday uh, occurred. And Mary Hannadell also lived in my uh, city of Toledo and was trained and encouraged by Cy Maul. Mary Hannadell was training for a 600-mile race between Sydney and Melbourne, Australia, and was running 18 miles a day, seven days a week, in preparation for this race. However, she developed severe weakness uh, from gastrointestinal bleeding along with a significant uh, magnesium deficiency. Uh, Mary Hannadell probably um, really had the, had the risk of losing her life uh, with uh, this uh, extraordinary uh, activity uh, in, under the circumstances of running in Australia in the heat and finally uh, uh, had to quit because of a, a, bleeding, uh, a bleeding ulcer. I might just say uh, one of the, that I was very interested in Mary's uh, going to Australia and competing in this race. And I got a call one night at one o'clock in the morning and it was from Mary and uh, she was in the hospital uh, telling me uh, and explaining uh, the problems that she had with a bleeding ulcer uh, from competing in this race in Australia. I also studied another extraordinary athlete, Lorna Michael, who trained, who was trained by Cy Maul, uh, and uh, Lorna uh, had run across the entire United States over a 64-day period. She also had a, a significant magnesium deficiency, as did Mary, and I concluded that there was a vicious cycle between high levels of adrenaline and in turn low levels of magnesium ions and if this combination of factors can cause uh, injuries uh, to a perfectly normal heart. <clears throat> I applied this concept to my studies of James Irwin, who had a near fatal cardiovascular complication after his Apollo 15 mission to the moon. Irwin became very short of breath in the presence of high space adrenaline levels uh, with greater circulatory demands upon the heart. Also, uh, Irwin experienced chest pain with exertion, which is uh, a symptom of uh, consistent with angina uh, uh, along, uh, associated with this lunar mission. Uh, in addition, Irwin's lunar uh, in-suit water device didn't function properly. This intensified the dehydration of microgravity along with the impairment in thermoregulation with very high lunar temperatures. This all emphasizes the fact that we don't belong in space and we certainly don't belong on the moon. And uh, I've emphasized uh, more recently the problems on the moon of inhaling uh, these very fine particulate matter, matter that we uh, that is loaded with iron. So the iron, the, the moon is a deadly place, not only because of the heat, but because of the iron-laden dust, which can be inhaled and create havoc in the blood vessels, particularly the blood vessels of the heart, and it's conducive to congestive heart failure. Recently, I have published with three editorials and a letter to the editor 
that the particulate matter released from iron brakes with over 90% of brakes made of iron is conducive to both high blood pressure and heart attacks. And this uh, necessitates legislation to stop the use of iron in making brakes. I have contacted our Virginia senators to introduce legislation uh, regarding this. Uh, in, re in answering uh, some of the questions that, that I have received, um, I, I might just emphasize the fact that as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a physician, even though I knew the studies would be a tough grind. After obtaining a BS degree as a chemistry zoology major over a three-year period, there were uh, four years of medical school, a year of internship, and then three years residency in internal medicine. I went into solo practice in internal medicine in 1960, and then I became a flight surgeon. And uh, now, uh, since 1960, um, I have been very, very successful, despite the fact that I really believe that I have average intelligence and uh, I'm hampered by uh, a memory which uh, I think is somewhat limited. Uh, I, I wish that this weren't so, but that's just the way it is. Uh, now, for some unknown reason, and, and, and I think that it just shows, some people might just say that I'm being excessively modest, that I can't accept all the invitations to present my work about space medicine in Europe, China, Japan, Dubai, Thailand. Uh, because of my age, uh, in my late 80s, um, I have been sending video presentations, uh, a half hour video, video presentation to uh, various uh, sites in, in Europe, as I say, China, Japan, Dubai, um, other, rather than making these long flights overseas. Uh, the long flights overseas have been triggering problems with bronchitis and um, my having been to China on four occasions since 212, primarily in Beijing, um, I uh, believe that I've been adversely affected uh, with a pneumonia. Uh, one trip I made to Haikou in, in China and um, the problems uh, with exposure to uh, dust uh, is somewhat similar to the problems that the astronauts have had on the moon. But in the case of the astronauts on the moon, uh, this was due strictly to uh, the iron dust, whereas um, with exposure to the dust in Beijing, for example, uh, I think that it, uh, it, it's a mixed bag with other ingredients in the dust besides <coughs> uh, iron. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have won several honors with my discoveries, uh, and most in my and I believe that my most important publication out of out of about seventy five publications is my paper uh, that extraordinary unremitting endurance exercise can damage a perfectly normal heart. In addition, uh, I have uh, published uh, two syndromes, the Apollo 15 space syndrome and the Neil Armstrong syndrome. Uh, a syndrome is a combination of symptoms and signs um, which help a doctor in making a diagnosis. So there are probably by now thousands of syndromes, but I'm very proud of the fact that, that I have published two um, space syndromes, uh, and, and both of them involve the high levels of adrenaline in space and in turn the low levels of magnesium.
Uh, I have published, uh, as I stated, probably at least 70 uh, publications uh, as the sole author. Um, and one of the advantages of being uh, the sole author is the fact that if the paper is good, you don't have to share the credit with anybody else uh, since I've been the sole author. Um, the other advantage is that um, if you don't agree with someone else, uh, you don't have to worry about it if you're the sole, sole author. And I believe that this is a big advantage. So you can go down in flames if the paper uh, is poor, but you can reach the heights of glory if you've hit the jackpot with a paper which really contributes uh, to the medical literature. I would like to think that, that most of the papers that I've written uh, are in that classification. My particular interest has been cardiology. And during the 34 years of my solo practice of internal medicine, I supervised over 5,000 symptom-limited Bruce Maximal treadmill stress tests. I was very fortunate to have moved to Toledo, Ohio, where I practice medicine and to have met the holder of the Guinness Book of Records, a Chinese Canadian. Um, I also studied uh, another extraordinary athlete, Lorna Michael, who trained by Simal, uh, having run across the entire United States in 64 days. She also had a significant magnesium deficiency, and I concluded that there was a vicious cycle between high levels of adrenaline and in turn low levels of magnesium ions, and that this combination of factors can injure a perfectly normal heart. I applied this concept to my studies of James Irwin, who had um, near fatal cardiovascular complications after his Apollo 15 mission to the moon. Irwin became very short of breath in the presence of high space flight adrenaline levels with greater circulatory demands upon the heart. Also, he had chest pain with exertion angina associated with um, the lunar missions. In addition, Irwin's lunar in-suit water device didn't function properly, intensifying the degree of microgravity along with impairment and thermoregulation. Um, this impairment and thermoregulation is simply this, that since I've already emphasized the fact that uh, I found that there was an, uh, in, you know, uh, an insult to the lining of the blood vessels, if one has an insult to the lining of the blood vessels, there's a, par a problem with impairment and convection. It, uh, simply, it, it simply means that there's uh, inability to lose body heat by transferring the heat uh, to the periphery from, uh, of the body. And in turn, the circulation, with impairment of the circulation to the periphery, there might be a problem with inability to um, tolerate heat simply because of that problem alone. Recently, I have published with three editorials and a letter to the editor that the particulate matter released from iron brakes with over 90% of brakes made of iron is conducive to both high blood pressure and heart attacks. This necessitates legislation to stop the use of iron in making brakes. I have contacted our Virginia senators <coughs> to introduce legislation regarding this. Now, this is a, a terrible situation that man um, has brought upon himself. We've known for 50 years since we went to the moon that the moon is, is, is covered with this very fine particulate matter uh, loaded with iron. And with the inhalation of iron, it has the potential of damaging the entire circulation. 
So what we have done is this. We know we were aware, we've been aware for 50 years that the inhalation of iron is deadly. But instead of uh, trying to do something about the problem, we have taken the deadliness of our being on the moon and, transferring, and transferred that deadliness and that danger to Earth in the form of our iron brakes. With perhaps 90% of brakes made of iron uh, because it is strong and cheap, here we are, instead of taking advantage of what we should have learned by our going to the moon with the deadliness of iron, we have transported it back to Earth in the form of iron brakes. Um, I have stated uh, that uh, I've uh, contacted uh, both of our senators in Virginia to see if uh, legislation could be introduced to prevent the manufacture of brakes made of iron. But so far, I think it's a losing, it's, it's a, so far it's a losing battle because the fact that I stated that iron is strong and cheap. Uh, we need legislation and we desperately need it. Uh, I have a website which I'm very proud of called uh, Fems in Space um, and it, it emphasizes the fact that females have a significant advantage over males in space. Um, to preserve the species, males are basically sperm providers and that's it. But to preserve the, the humanity um, the, the female role, as far as the cardiovascular system is, is concerned, for example, the female um, availability of estrogen is a big advantage that males don't have. The other advantage that, that the, uh, the females have, in addition to estrogens, is menstruation. I have emphasized a great deal in various articles, the advantage the females have with menstruation. With a loss of 30 to 50 cc's of blood every month, this is a huge advantage from a medical standpoint as far as females are concerned. Males have no physiological way of losing iron. And with a loss of iron, uh, there is protection, protection against what is referred to as oxidative stress because iron damages blood vessels if it's a, there's an excessive amount. So males can offset this advantage that females have by donating blood, I would say, four times a year if there's no contraindication. In other words, if the doctor doesn't want a male to give blood for various reasons. And the male can, should give blood. Uh, otherwise, if there's no contraindication contra up to possibly the age of 80. By donating blood, males uh, can, give, can, can offset the problems. Uh, and one of the major uh, uh, problems, as I've emphasized, is the exposure to iron. So this is a very, very important factor and provides a big advantage. I might go through a few articles that I have written uh, and published in the last uh, 10, 20 years or so. Um, I have emphasized the fact that I have published probably at least 70 articles um, and half of those 70 articles or so um, are, have been are peer reviewed, whereas the others are, are all been published in Spaceflight magazine. Um, and since I've always been the sole author of my articles, um, I can go down in flames if the article is no good. But uh, if it is worthwhile, I can take all the glory without having to share it with anyone else. I might just mention a few articles that I've published that are peer-reviewed that I think are worthwhile. 
Um, I've already mentioned one, correcting magnesium deficiencies may prolong life. Here's another one that's very important, titled spaceflight related endothelial dysfunction with potential congestive heart failure. Endo the endothelium is the lining of the blood vessels, and I've already emphasized the fact that the endothelium, that is the lining of the blood vessels, is vulnerable to injuries because of high adrenaline and in turn low magnesium iron levels and vicious cycles between the two. And this can cause spasm of the blood vessels. It can cause angina, which means chest pain with exertion and shortness of breath. And all these factors can be uh, uh, prevented if one has enough magnesium and in turn with enough magnesium, lower adrenaline levels and in turn a lower risk of damaging the circulation and damaging the heart muscle. And one of the articles that I have published is the case for an all-female crew to Mars. Um, I think that, that an all-female crew to Mars would be a big advantage over um, a uh, mixed group of both males and females because of the cardiovascular advantages that females have. Um, I've written uh, in the last two years three editorials uh, about what I think is one of the most dangerous aspects of our lives, um, the exposure to iron from breaks. And a most, a, an article that I published about a year ago I think is very, very important. It's an editorial called The Iron Break Dust Age and the Female Advantage. And I've already emphasized the fact that females have a big cardiovascular advantage that males don't have, um, and the, the legislation to prevent the manufacture of iron breaks is very, very important. Keep in mind that with the world population of probably about 7.5 billion, um, hundreds, I believe that hundreds of millions of people are in jeopardy and, are, and, and with their, risking their lives because of exposure uh, to this very fine iron particulate matter that one can't see and one can't smell and can easily enter our, the, our homes um, and businesses and we are being subjected to this terrible problem without our being aware of it. And again, I emphasize that what is necessary is legislation. 